My name is Howard H. Vogel. Uh, today is September 12, 2005. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee for the interview of Judge James H. Jarvis II uh, here at the Howard Baker Federal Courthouse in Knoxville. This interview is being conducted as a part of the Legal History Project for the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. I'm James H. Jarvis, uh, United States District Judge, Senior Judge for the Eastern District of Tennessee. Uh, uh, Chief Judge Emeritus <laughs> of the Eastern District, yes. Judge Jarvis, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and, and I hope you'll, you'll permit me to do that. Uh, let me go ahead and say, if I happen to ask you a question you don't want to answer, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm sure you'll give me direction on that. Well. May we start at the beginning? Uh, when were you born? February 28, 1937. There's about uh, 18 inches of snow on the ground that morning. Here in Knoxville? Yeah, it's Fort Sanders Hospital. My mother and dad lived down the street uh, on Laurel Avenue. Uh, my daddy was, uh, uh, start, he just started practicing up here in Knoxville. Hadn't been out of law school too long. <clears throat> Do you have siblings? I have uh, two sisters. One's deceased. Uh, the other one is living in Macon, Georgia. She's married to a doctor. She has a house full of children and grandchildren, and she's uh, very, very happy. Um, and uh, my other sister was uh, unfortunate. She had scoliosis and, and some emphysema, and she died uh, when she was 58 years old. Did you then go on to grow up here in Knoxville? I did. Lived out in Westmoreland Heights. We uh, moved into a new house out there uh, uh, from the hospital. Uh, went directly to a brand new house that my grandfather uh, helped uh, pay for on Orchard Road, right across the street from your old, your law partner. Bill Young. Bill That's right. Young, yeah. And uh, uh, lived there from 1937 until 1951, and uh, went to Bearden, Bearden School, elementary school. Uh, uh, they, held, they held classes in, a, in, a, in, in old army barracks, had a pot belly stove in the middle of the room that just got cherry red, and uh, there was always something uh, being put on it to stink the room up, you know. <laughs> and it was, uh, the kids today wouldn't understand. They'd think they were in abject poverty <laughs> the, way we, the way we lived. Uh, but we were very happy and uh, uh, we somehow got an education. Now, back at that time, Orchard Road was sort of way out in the county, wasn't it? Well, it was pretty far out, yeah. The, uh, the Eastern State, uh, 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 hospital, which was a mental hospital, it was full of patients in those days. It was right up the road from us, uh, about uh, half a mile, and the end of the end of the car line, as they called it, was right up the top of the hill there, above the hospital. And that's uh, as far as as far as the bus line came. Of course, it was a streetcar line in those days. Do you have fond memories of uh, attending high school at Bearden? Well, <clears throat> I didn't graduate from Bearden High School. I graduated from Maryville High School, but uh, I have a lot of fond memories of going to school there uh, from first grade to, well, I went to Thaxton School the first year, and then, and then uh, uh, went, to, went to Bearden. Uh, but yeah, that was, those are great memories. Things were simple, I and mean, we didn't lock our houses up. We didn't. We left the keys in the car. Uh, there wasn't any. There weren't any drugs in those days that anybody knew about. Of course, uh, the town was dry. It didn't have any alcohol except beer, and uh, um, so uh, that's not to say there wasn't alcohol here. There was, <laughs> there was liquor here. We had bootleggers, and it was just an accepted thing. But 
Um, life was simple. Life was not uh, wasn't as hectic as it is now. It was easier to grow up in those days than I think it is now. How did it happen that you ended up graduating from Maryville High School? Well, in 1951, uh, uh, the uh, my father bought a farm up in Blunt County called Blackberry Farm. And uh, it, was a, it was an inn, it was run uh, on American plan, and we could accommodate, uh, I think, uh, 12, uh, 12 couples. We, uh, we ran it as an inn uh, for until 1966. And my mother uh, was the primary uh, manager of that inn. My aunt ran it one year for us, but it never was profitable. It uh, wasn't really meant to be too profitable. It was kind of a tax write-off, I take it. Uh, we also ran a farm in conjunction with it, I raised cattle, raised uh, all the vegetables that we served, a lot of the vegetables we served at the, at the inn right there on the farm. And uh, the, uh, I was the yard man and the, uh, and the uh, baggage man and uh, also did a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, kind of guiding people this place and that place, took people fishing, those kind of things for a couple, two or three years. And uh, so uh, we, I went to Maryville High School my last two years and graduated from there. And my sisters went to school in Maryville, and we'd drive in there every day. It takes about 30 minutes to drive to school every morning. But those were uh, kind of fun days. We really got to know each other pretty well, <laughs> driving back and forth to school. But uh, I, I, it was tough on all of us because we had to make new friends, and we had to make some big adjustments in our lives and but uh, it taught us how to make friends new friends and how to uh, adjust so it was a good experience I think for us and my two sisters then went away to school one of them went to St. Catharines up in uh, Virginia and one went to St. Anne's my sister Catherine went to St. Anne's my sister Anne went to St. Catharines I understand you recently, although you didn't graduate from Bearden, you recently attended their uh, reunion. How did that go? Well, it was interesting. I hadn't seen those people, you know, in 40 years, I guess, and a lot of them. And uh, uh, we had about uh, 30, 35 people there uh, out of a class of, say, I would say 60 people, maybe. Were any of those classmates lawyers? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I can't think of it if there are. No, I don't believe they, any of them went into law. What was it like growing up with your dad uh, as a lawyer? Well, <clears throat> certainly uh, I heard a lot about lawsuits and, you know, daddy would come home and talk to mother about it and this, that, and the other, and then he'd tell stories about cases. And, and uh, uh, we'd listen, and uh, my mother said that one time I, I, I got out in the front yard and I was running around, I was about three years old, running around in circles hollering, lawsuit, lawsuit, lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you recall a favorite story that your dad told about his career as a lawyer? Well, there's so many of them. He, uh, <laughs> Not any particular story, I don't think, Howard. I, I just, uh, he had, uh, he'd come home one time, he had this case, when, and he practiced law after we moved, in Knoxville after we moved up to Blackberry Farm, he'd drive in every day. And that took him about an hour, you know, both ways. Uh, but he had a case over in uh, Cookville with, uh, with uh, Jared Maddox and uh, uh, his law partner. And they were teaming up and they had a last clear chance case. And uh, last clear chance was a, kind of a new thing in those days, you know. 
because contributory negligence was an absolute bar, last clear chance presupposes contributory negligence and it's approximate cause problem. And so uh, this boy was hurt. I mean, this, this plaintiff was really hurt badly. And uh, they, they poured everything they had into it and they tried that case. And I can remember my daddy had all these big uh, 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 poster boards with, with numbers and stuff, you know, all about the damages. And that was kind of a new way of doing things with demonstrative evidence in front of a jury. We didn't do it back. We're talking now in the fifties. And uh, they, uh, he'd come home and talk about it. And lo and behold, they won a lawsuit and got a big verdict. I don't know what it was. It was maybe 50 or a hundred thousand dollars, which was huge in those days. And uh, he talked about that lawsuit for a long time. And, uh, and uh, of course, he was practicing law with some colorful people. Uh, I mean, Who were they? they Bill O'Neill and uh, W.P. O'Neill, who had a very wry sense of humor, who had a way of uh, depositions, uh, looking at a lawyer's file, you know, uh, uh, while he was taking a deposition. Very clever man. I, I've heard that he could read upside down. He can. He did. And uh, he was a very, very thorough lawyer and a really good lawyer. And he had a, a, a good mind, like like a steel trap. And then there was John Jennings, Jr., who was this congressman here in town. And he uh, he was from Scott County, like, <laughs> like the people who followed him, uh, the Bakers and... Uh, and uh, and uh, of course, uh, Congressman Duncan. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, had a great command of Shakespeare and uh, of the Bible. This was Judge Jennings? Judge Jennings did. And he would quote the Bible. And uh, they say when he'd get down to court with uh, somebody like Ray Jenkins, that everybody in town would come down and watch and listen to them, when they, particularly when they argued their case. Uh, that, that didn't happen very often after that. But in those days, they still had some real colorful lawyers, and, and uh, they would get down in front of the jury and cry. And carry on. It, was, it, was, it was a show, you know. I understand that uh, Judge Jennings went to American Temperance University. Is that well, right? now, you know, I don't know. I don't know where he went to school. <laughs> Did he go to? <laughs> I think it was in Harriman. I'm not sure. It's That's not good. there now, apparently. No, it's not there now. There's not any <laughs> temperance down there that I know of. But uh, did you go to your dad's law office as a little boy? Oh yeah, we go up there on Sundays, and uh, after Sunday school, and we'd uh, and he'd piddle around doing something I don't know what, and uh, we'd get on we had a dictaphone that was new, had a little disc on it, you know, a little blue plastic disc. And we'd talk on it, you know, and we'd record, and Daddy record us talking, and we were going to keep those. I don't know whatever happened to them. Did uh, the law firm have a lot of lawyers show up for uh, Sunday to work? Well, <clears throat> I'm sure that some of them came up there, but because they, uh, they, they worked every Saturday, I know that, all day long Saturday. Of course, that was a big day. Everybody came to town, see, and, and uh, that's when they got their lawyer, yeah, when they come to town. Now, back at that time, you're still uh, a young man in, in uh, mm -hmm. middle school or, or yeah. high school. How, yeah. how big was the Knoxville Bar at that time, if you remember? Howard, I don't remember exactly, but I would say, you know, I believe uh, less than 100, 100 practicing attorneys I really think that's true. It was at night, in, at night in the fifties, sixties. How old were you when you thought you might like to be a lawyer? Well, <clears throat> I really thought I want to go into the hotel business, and I I'd, uh, signed up at Cornell University for a, to learn how to do that. And uh, then I changed my mind, and I. I was going to run Blackberry Farm, see. And uh, I changed my mind. I thought, well, no. And my daddy 
said, why don't you just go to law school, you know. He didn't put any pressure on me, but yet it was a strong suggestion. <laughs> and so I got me a, got, got over to the university and took a pre-law curriculum in uh, liberal arts and went to law school. And uh, I think I made the right choice. I think you did too. <clears throat> did you ever, as a little boy, see your father try a lawsuit? Not as a little boy, no. Were you a lawyer uh, the first time you saw your dad try a case? No, I was probably in law school. How uh, did you happen to select the University of Tennessee to go to college? Well, I didn't have any, didn't have a choice in the matter, I didn't think. <laughs> it's kind of what Dad suggested. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, nowadays the kids say, well, I'd like to go away to school, Dad. I'd like to go to Harvard or Yale or Northwestern, for instance, where my last child went to college. Uh, you know, $30,000 a year. <laughs> I just assumed that the, my parents sent me to school. It cost about $150 a quarter. Which wasn't cheap in those days. I mean, people didn't have a lot of money in those days. I mean, they had some, but I guess that verdict helped him a little. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any favorite professors that you remember from your college days? Well, <clears throat> I guess everybody's favorite, maybe everybody's favorite, was uh, Colonel Warner, who was just a peach of a guy. And uh, he was a dean of the law school when I was there. I think maybe Dean Wicker had been there, the dean before I came over. <clears throat> Whom, yeah, he stayed there and taught, uh, Wicker did. Personal property, he was a nice fella. He was a southern gentleman, raised irises, and a uh, uh, low-key guy. You had his, uh, you had his uh, 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 lecture before you went in there, because it's been the same lecture for years. <laughs> Uh, Warner was a, he, he was a storyteller and a very entertaining man. And I liked uh, uh, Tommy Ball's daddy, uh, who taught uh, procedure. And um, that was one subject I did real well in. The rest of them, I, I was just an average student. <clears throat> when did you graduate from law school? 1960 in August. Uh, while you were a college and a law student, uh, when you weren't going to class, what'd you do in your spare time? Lord, I had a lot of hobbies. Uh, uh, I worked up in a law firm some. Uh, I had to do something because I was married and I had uh, one child. I bought Paul Parker's old car. That's the only car I had, a 53 Ford, used, very, very used. <laughs> And, uh, but when I could find some time, I'd go fishing, hunting. I'd do, uh, I didn't play any golf in those days much, uh, if at all, it was too expensive for me. But uh, <coughs> hunting and fishing, mostly. Uh, other than your dad, were there other lawyers in the family? No. What what did your grandfathers do? My grandfather on my father's side, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, was a uh, was a professor. <coughs> excuse me, and uh, he uh, he was uh, superintendent of the. Uh, uh, school up at the academy up at Jellicoe, and Jellicoe was a bustling place. And uh, he, he, he taught there, he was the head of the place. Uh, Grace Moore was one of the students up there, famous opera singer, you know. And a lot of, a lot of money up there and a lot of wealth up there, and it was a good, very fine school. Nobody knows much about it now. 
And then from Jellico, they moved uh, down here south and uh, went, went, I think, McMahon County Schools. He was the head of McMahon County Schools. And then he was uh, superintendent down in uh, Loudoun County at Lenore City. And that's when my daddy was born when, at Lenore City. He had seven children. And, uh, and the grandma lived with them and uh, they had always had a cow and they always had chickens and they had a pig or two every year and uh, 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 I've got an idea, it was a pretty Spartan existence, uh, uh, you know. And he was also a lay Methodist minister and he had a church down at, uh, down toward Athens uh, where he go on Sundays sometimes and and preach a place called Union Chapel. Several members of our family are buried down there. So <clears throat> then he became, uh, then, then he decided to get into the uh, insurance business. He, he, he taught all over. He knew everybody. And he did quite well selling insurance to his old, <laughs> old, old students. And uh, so he lived then in Chattanooga. Uh, my uh, grandfather, my grandmother on my father's side died during the flu epidemic in 19, I don't know, 16 or something, you know, 18. And uh, <clears throat> she was a, she was a Danish, uh, her name was Erickson. There are a lot of Ericsons down in that area right now, down in uh, near Athens, around in there. Erickson. Uh, and then, then on my mother's side, uh, her daddy was a uh, uh, self-taught man of a big family of uh, Catholic kids from Connecticut, and uh, he was a paper maker, and he he was really bright, and he he invented. Uh, he, the company he was with sent him over to Europe and he, he, he did a lot of research over there and he came back and uh, invented some machinery that will, would produce pulp that when put on a wire or put on a machine would make, would make glassine paper. And uh, glassine paper in those days became very, very popular. Wax sticks, wax paper, mm -hmm. uh, chewing gum wrappers, uh, uh, Band-Aid wrappers, uh, all kinds of uh, uses. In the cigarette industry, he, uh, they, they learned to laminate uh, tin foil to, uh, to paper. He, he had a lot of inventions, a lot of patents and he made a lot of money. He had eighth grade education. My mother had uh, a sister, Marion Calloway, who lived here in Knoxville, and, uh, and then uh, a brother who was stayed in the paper making business. And her mother was a, was a, um, uh, mother's name was, I can't think, anyway, uh, she died in an automobile accident with my mother driving the car. Uh, they, they were going from Knoxville back up to Regalsville, Pennsylvania, where they had a very nice home there. Uh, and uh, and uh, they, she got killed in West Virginia. A truck ran them off the road, and my mother never did get over that. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in a convertible. My mother was a, the youngest, and she was the pet. and. Uh, uh, she they went to school. She went to school in, during the depression, you know. And uh, my mother had a chauffeur and a car. And, and they come around every morning to pick my mother up in front of the girls' dorm, take her up on the hill. <laughs> That's the truth. And she had this cord convertible, it was a pretty car. And uh, that's what they had the accident in. My, my, my grandma would come down on a train and they'd gone back together. She got down here by virtue of the fact that her sister Marion came down here and went to school, went, went, went to school. and then Marion married 
uh, a Tennessee boy who was a professional football bas baseball player, Frank Calloway. And uh, he, he owned a store here in town called the Athletic House, which my grandfather bought for him. And uh, so uh, he, his grandfather gave all his children, but he stayed very generous with his children. Built, gave us our house and Marion Calloway her house and the business and everything. And uh, so that's how they got down here. That's how my mother got down here. And uh, I guess they had her come down here so her sister could look after her. <laughs> I don't know why else she came down, but that's where she met my daddy. You uh, graduated from law school and I guess uh, got ready to take the bar exam? Oh yeah, I got yeah. ready to take the bar exam. Did you take the bar exam before you graduated or after? No, after I graduated. And was it tough? Well, it wasn't too bad because I'd gone to that uh, review course that Bob Crosley taught. Crosley did his review course back then? Oh yeah, 1960. Was it still a proven uh, product back at that time? Was it like what? A, a proven product, everybody had to go? Uh, nobody, you didn't have to go. I mean, you know, I had to pay $75 to go. <laughs> that was a lot of money in those days. <clears throat> but it was a long course, you know, went on for months. <clears throat> Reviewed all of Tennessee law, mostly. You know, it, it prepared you for that bar exam, I'll tell you, guarantee it did. Was it your plan to join your father's law firm? Yeah, it was an un unspoken thing. And what was the name of the firm at that time? It was O'Neill, Parker, and Jarvis. And who were the, 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 the three men whose names were in the firm at that time? O'Neill, let's see, it was O'Neill, Jarvis. It was O'Neill and Jarvis, that's what it was, O'Neill and Jarvis. And then Paul Parker and Ben Williamson were, were there. Ben hadn't been there very long. Paul had been there for some time. And then they changed the firm's name to O'Neill, Jarvis, Parker, and Williamson. And then uh, I practiced about 10 years with those gentlemen. Uh, my daddy left the law firm and went out on his own. I stayed with the law firm. We moved out of the mercantile building on Gay Street down to a building where you all presently are, but you're out of that building now. You're part of the Baker Courthouse Complex. But uh, we built a little law office down there and uh, where, where, that, where you are now. And, uh, and I stayed there a couple, two or three years, and then I got kind of burned out and uh, so that gave me about 13 years of law practice, and then I moved over to Blount County and uh, practiced with Ron Mears and Charles Dungan, who later became a circuit judge. Ron Mears still was a practicing attorney. He's now retired. And then, uh, um, I had an opportunity to uh, serve on the circuit court bench, which my daddy didn't want me to do, and uh, said I was too young, and uh, I was 34 years old. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I went ahead and did it anyway, and he was not, said I couldn't make a living doing that, and uh, I was too young to do that, and I'd be, uh, you know, just too rambunctious to be a judge, and, and so, uh, I was the only judge in Blount County solely sitting in Blount County. I was the first judge that ever sat solely in Blount County. And I had uh, <clears throat> a tremendous docket. And I, I'd try, I'd, I'd dispose of about 1,200 to 1,500 divorce cases a year. And then I had all the, most of the chancery court work and all of the, the uh, civil civil uh, 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 cases as well, in addition to that, that the circuit court ordinarily handles, the law and equity court. 
and I did that for, for 13 years. Let me take you back to your early days as a practicing lawyer. Uh, do you re remember who your first client was? Howard, I, I, I really don't. You asked me that earlier and I can't recall who, who it was, but I remember. Who was your first most memorable client? Oh, well, I had this, uh, we had this case, it belonged to Williamson and he, he it was kind of a dog case. And uh, he, he, uh, he enlisted my, my help such as it was. I don't know how long I've been practicing, not too long. Looked like I was about 15 years old. I was only about 23, 24 years old. I like graduated from law school. Was, uh, I was the youngest lawyer in Knoxville for a long time. Then Frank Flynn came along, and he, he, was, he was younger than I was. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, this old boy, uh, uh, this old boy named Ben Green, and I'll never forget it. Uh, he was a crippled boy to begin with, and he, was, he liked to drink a lot. And he lived over here on Browns Mountain in South Knoxville, poor as a church mouse. And uh, he, uh, he, uh, he was out with some friends one night and they were all drinking and they ran off the road like they want to do and down into a ravine and uh, pinned old Ben in that car. And uh, Ben had a bad arm anyway, you know, and he carried it right here and he dug it in his, he dug it in his, uh, in his ribs. He did, all his life, but uh, this aggravated that situation. And uh, so we, uh, Ben Williamson said, now we got to take care of Ben Green. You get this case ready. And so uh, I did, and then he got with, with me too. And every, every evening, you know, we'd go out and look for witnesses in the Ben Green case just because it was so, it, was, it became entertaining. And we go over in Browns Mountain, and, and uh, we uh, one night we went to this house, and this guy was supposed to be a witness in this case, you know. He was supposed to be in the car with them when the accident happened. We knocked on the door, you know, and there was a scurrying around in there, you know, and we could hear some chickens in there. And uh, finally the old boy came to the door, and uh, he said, what you want? And he said, He'd been in the bed. You look over there and see, he'd been in this old bed. It was an old, it was just kind of a shack. <clears throat> we said, well, we understand you were riding with Ben Green when he had his wreck. He said, I was? Yeah, you were. Well, maybe, he says, I just don't hardly remember, but uh, anyway, yeah, I remember when that happened, but I don't know whether I was with him or not. And, uh, Ben says, well, that driver that was driving that car, was he drunk? No, I don't think he was drunk. I don't think he'd been drinking. Well, we had to have that witness, you know. About that time, a chicken came out from under the <laughs> bed, started running around in the house, you know. <laughs> he'd tied those chickens up by the legs together and thrown them all under that bed. <laughs> they stayed with him at night so that, the, so that the foxes wouldn't get those chickens. He'd keep he'd bring them in the house and just close the door. That's true. Whatever happened to Ben Green? Well, we, we tried the case, we tried against Joe Yancey, and uh, uh, I, I, I'll never forget it. And, and uh, it was the first jury case I ever tried, and old Ben, he, he'd been coaching me, you know, and I got down there in front of that jury. <laughs> I talked about Ben Green and pinned in that car, you know, poor crippled fella. And we got a verdict for seventy-five hundred dollars by George. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Has a lot of money. Twenty-five hundred dollars. <laughs> <clears throat> what was your uh, starting salary at, at the law? Two hundred fifty dollars a month. Big dough. Did you have a secretary assigned to you? No. How long did you practice law before you had a secretary? Mm, three or four years. What was a normal work day like there at well, the law firm? I don't know. You just come in there, but they didn't have any hours you had to keep. You know, we didn't keep hours like we do now. I mean, but you, they expected you in there <clears throat> earlier, and I wanted to go. And <laughs> I go in there, you know. And Bill O'Neill always came in late. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ben always came in late. Paul was always there. My daddy got in there early. Uh, and, and I'd better get in there early. And uh, and then Ben and Bill would stay late. And that's kind of the way it worked. Uh, but uh, we just, uh, we did a lot of adjusting insurance at $25 an hour, $15 an hour. What was the majority of the work that the firm did Insurance, back then? Insurance defense work, and uh, we did a little plaintiff work, and Bill O'Neill did a lot of state work. My dad did some, too. What was the Knoxville Bar like back then? Were there activities? Very, very congenial bunch of men and women. Uh, didn't have many women, but uh, I remember Irma Greenwood very well. She was a good lawyer and a fine lady. She was up at the Kramer firm. But uh, uh, a lot of collegiality, a lot of trust. Uh, you, you, your word was your bond. Uh, you get on the phone and say, well, let's take, you know, take some depositions. When you want to take them, agree on it, you know. And if something came up and you couldn't make it, you called them and said, look, we, I can't take it today or tomorrow or whenever. You, you, you'd like to call them for the very day you're going to take it. But <clears throat> and and uh, contrary to the way things are today, it's dog eat dog out here today. And it's not, you don't have the collegiality. You don't have the civility between lawyers that we had then. And there was a lot of joking and carrying on. and. Uh, uh, in those days, and there was no uh, malice like uh, toward each other, and uh, it was just a, it was a profession. It wasn't a business. And now I think it's more of a business than it is a profession. I may be dead wrong. I hadn't practiced law in a long, long time. Why but, do um, you think those changes have occurred? Well, I think it's uh, uh, it, it's more. It's more, it's more profitable to do business this way now. Keep your time. We started keeping time. Daddy had those time sheets, and that was something he introduced to the firm. And uh, every, every day, he'd pull them out and give them to his secretary, and she'd put them in the various files. But uh, now they keep, keep their time on the computer, and it's there. Uh, it's more expensive to practice law now than it used to be. A lot more expensive. We had linoleum floors and old steel furniture. We didn't have, you know, fancy stuff. Window air conditioners. And there was a lot of soot in Knoxville. It was always sooty in the in the in the, uh, in the windowsill where you sometimes stack files up there in the windowsill. At that time, the firm was in the Mercantile Building. Mercantile Building, where second floor. Were there other lawyers in the mercantile building? Oh yeah, there was other lawyers. Uh -huh. J.D. Lee was down the hall, and Kerry Garrett, and and uh, uh, Stansberry. He was down the hall, and uh, uh, Roy Stansberry, and uh, I don't know who all. My, my secretary was uh, up there uh, working for Kerry Garrett. I think uh, I think uh, Kenny Hall was down there with him. It was hey. quite a crew. Your secretary is Mary Lou Heath. Mary Lou Heath. And she is your secretary today. That's right. She's been my secretary since 1984. We'll come back to her in, in, okay, in a few minutes. Okay. Back at, in, the, in the early days, did the lawyers tend to have lunch at any particular place in town? Well, yeah, they'd eat lunch at the Farragut Hotel a lot uh, up there. And then they'd eat lunch down at the Garden and then at Frank's. and. Uh, uh, yeah, there were, there were several places. S and W cafeteria. That's where Judge Taylor always had lunch with his entourage. Were those uh, occasions for storytelling? Oh yeah, I mean you know you talk about all kinds of things, and you talk about your personal life too. You know, I mean we were we were everybody knew everybody's problem. I mean, if uh, Calvin Taylor had a problem, Ben Williamson knew it, and and vice versa, and. Uh, if, uh, uh, you know, we just, uh, we were, we were friends. 
Back at that time, uh, Knoxville had many colorful lawyers, and certainly Ray Jenkins yeah. was one of them. Did you ever get to watch him try a lawsuit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him try a lawsuit. Do, do you have any particular memory of, of his character or personality that you'd like to share? Well, all I know is uh, he, he, was, uh, he was outrageous. He, he and George Montgomery liked to kid each other a lot, and they were in the same building up here at the bank of uh, Knoxville, the old bank of Knoxville. I got on the elevator one day, with, made the mistake of getting on the elevator with both of them one day. And uh, they were kidding me. And there was an elevator full of women in there. And uh, Ray said something very racy and suggestive about me. Jimmy boy, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, George says, yeah. And uh, I was red faced and those women were, were just, you know, embarrassed. And uh, that's the way they were, they liked to embarrass people. <laughs> They were just awful, uh, those guys were, and they just liable to pinch somebody too, you know, <laughs> on the elevator. Uh, they were two characters, and they, 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 uh, uh, Jenkins was up above uh, Jaws Montgomery, and they talked back and forth outside, you know, outside the building, looking up at each other, looking down at each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's the way they were. People were lighthearted in those days. They just had fun, that's all. Now, there came a time when the firm moved from the Mercantile Building to this address here on Cumberland. Cumberland Avenue, yes, sir. You, any, anything unusual happened in the moving of oh, the firm? Oh, yes, yes. We, we had a lot of unusual things happened. Uh, but uh, one of the most unusual things was we, uh, uh, Meredith Bond and I, yeah, Meredith was a member of that firm then, uh, we were in charge, we were put in charge of moving the library, okay? A lot of books, I mean a lot of books. And uh, we were also supposed to practice law during this period of time, make some money for the firm. And uh, <clears throat> we found that, found that pretty hard to do. And so we didn't apparently move fast enough for Mr. Williamson. Well, Mr. Williamson showed up, up at the office uh, one evening about uh, nine o'clock and Meredith and I were putting up books and uh, he said uh, you boys should have had this done a long time ago and um, we said well Mr. Ben, ben we've been doing the best we can well they ain't good enough I ought to fire both of you matter of fact I'm firing both of you and I said well all right Meredith just, Meredith just Threw down a book and walked out. And I looked at him and I followed Meredith out of there. Went out and got in the car and took off. As far as we were known, as far as we knew, we were fired. Well, well, what happened next? I don't know. Somehow or another, Ben called and said, now come on back up here <laughs> the next morning. Uh, ben may have been a bit impaired at the time. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he, he, really, he really threw the book at us, so. Now, during your time uh, for practicing here in Knoxville before you moved over to Maryville, yeah. do you remember who the judges were over here in Knox County? Well, there was, uh, before I moved to Maryville, well, well, Judge Kelly was here, you know. He was a, he was a fixture. He was, a, he was a, here, uh, and then uh, he was a circuit judge. And then there was T. Edward Cole, and then there was Jimmy, uh, J Jim uh, Haynes, and uh, then there was, uh, after that, I guess, uh, T. Mac Blackburn was the, uh, was the chancellor. Later, uh, Lynn Broughton was chancellor. Um, T. Mac Blackburn went down with secretary, executive secretary of the Supreme Court. Uh, after that, and was that in that position when I became a circuit judge. But, uh, and then out in the county, uh, 
uh, Wayne Oliver over in Blount County. We practiced all over East Tennessee. And uh, William I. Davis up in Upper East Tennessee. And by the way, he was my favorite judge, William I. Davis. Why, why was that? Well, he, he was a good listener. And he was polite to lawyers. And he was a he was a wise man. And uh, he uh, he uh, he didn't jump on you, you know, or he didn't hurry you along. He just had like he had all day to try the case. Now, I tried a case up in front of William I one day in Tazewell, and it was a subrogation case involving a truck trucking trucking company and a trucker pulled out in front of a train and the train hit the load of coal and there was about $15,000 in damages to the truck. And it's one of those great cases that they gave me to try, you know. <laughs> you just go up there and at, 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 at see the railroad and uh, you, you, you'll do fine. Well, went up there and old man Montgomery, George's daddy, represented the railroad and tried a jury case up there against that old man and uh, in front of William I, and I thought I was going to get directed out of court, but I didn't. The train was there, I mean, when the guy pulled out there right in front of that train. And the jury gave me a verdict, $15,000. Well, Lord have mercy, that's a $5,000 fee. And so I felt really good coming back to Knoxville, and I thought, oh, yeah, that's great. So along came a motion for a new trial, motion for judgment NOV and uh, uh, went up there to Tazewell argue and I thought well I, you know judge won't disturb this surely and old man Montgomery argued all morning long he had all the cases and Davis listened very very carefully and listened to both of us and then he said I should have directed a verdict in this case and set that judgment aside I still like Judge Davis. He took the biggest verdict I'd ever had at that time away from me. But I knew he'd done the right thing and he made me he didn't make me feel bad about it. He just he was very very deferential to me and uh, 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 you know and he bragged on me, you know how a judge would do you know he does that you're getting ready to get whooped. <laughs> <laughs> Now, back at that time, the United States District Judge was Robert Love Taylor. Robert Love Taylor, he sure was. Did you ever try any cases in front of Judge Taylor? A lot Taylor? of them, a lot of cases. Lot and of how was that experience? Well, it was different, let's put it that way. He, he was a very impatient man when the time, time I started practicing before him. And, but he, he, he was a bright fellow, a bright man, and gosh almighty, very experienced. And, and honest as the day is long, very ethical, very fine man, but very difficult to try a case in front of. And uh, you know, he 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 wouldn't let you vore dire the jury, but he was to speak of. And uh, if he'd heard enough, he'd just say, "Call the next witness." You know, and you wouldn't be through, but he'd just do it. Got by with it, and so. He decided that he was going to appoint me to try a criminal case. I didn't know anything about trying criminal cases. I just happened to be in the courtroom one day uh, wait, waiting, and uh, he, he, he appointed me to represent a fellow. He stole a car and take across state lines, and I represented him. And uh, uh, a day or two before trial, uh, Carl Sawpaw called me and said, well, has your man pled guilty yet? And I said, no, he hadn't pled guilty. We're going to try it, Mr. Sawpaw. Well, Judge ain't gonna like that. I said, well, you know what? He says he's innocent, and I'm gonna try it. Well, I got down there in the morning of trial in front of a jury, and uh, Judge says, uh, he's explaining to the jury, he says, this man says he's not guilty, not, not guilty. He said he's not guilty. Grand jury found him guilty. He, he says he's not guilty. 
And Mr. Jarvis, you want to plead this man or not? I said, no, <laughs> Your Honor, from the jury. Your Honor, I, we, we're going to try. He said, well, he shook his head, you know, those little jaws to go back and forth. <laughs> you know, he gets mad as a hornet. So we, he didn't want to try that case. We tried that case. You know, he never appointed me another case. <laughs> never did. And I was so happy. Well, I lost the case. <laughs> I told you, I told you, told you I'll do that. Well, Judge, you know. But that's the kind of guy he was. He was in later years. He was not too very tolerant. To... He was right, of course. I should have pled him guilty, but that ain't who you're working for, you know. <clears throat> you moved uh, over to Maryville to practice law. Yeah, yeah I did. And practiced with uh, Charlie Dungan and Ron Mears. Yeah. Uh, what was it like to practice with Ron? Well, it was almost like practicing law with Ben. Very intense person. Uh, very uh, more eccentric than Ben. Uh, very bright man. Very bright man. Very thorough man. Came to work late and stayed late. Uh, prepared cases very thoroughly. He, 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 he a doggone good lawyer. I believe when he was practicing over there, the best lawyer in Blunt County. Uh, but uh, they had some eccentricities about him that uh, I found difficult to uh, handle. And uh, I, uh, there was an opening then for the circuit judgeship. They're going to establish a law and equity court over there. And Houston Goddard was the senator there, and he introduced the bill and got it passed. And then Carl Colo was the senator when I was sworn in. And uh, as I say, T. Mac Blackburn was uh, the secretary of the Supreme Court, and he was the guy with the money. Uh, so we went over to T. Mac Blackburn's office, Carl and I did after I got sworn in, and uh, to get me a typewriter and, you know, some paper and stuff to, to start my business over there in Blunt County. And uh, T said, well, I ain't got any money. Y'all just with some Dixie, I haven't got any money. Carl says, you know who I am? And he says, no, I don't. Carl Cole is all I know. He says, I'm a senator from Blunt County and I'll make you so sorry. <laughs> He looked at him like, you insolent <laughs> man, you. And, uh, you know, about a week later, I got a Selectronic uh, <laughs> IBM typewriter, and I got paper, and I got a budget for secretary, and I got all of that. And uh, started out practicing down the old Chancery Courtroom there in Maryland. Uh, didn't have a courtroom, you know, in those days. They built me one after that, though. Were, were you appointed or elected? I was appointed by Winfield Dunn. <clears throat> how did that come about? Uh, you were interested in, in the new position, but, but how were you matched up for the spot? Well, uh, they were looking around for somebody to, 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 uh, to appoint for that position. Uh, I was the new man in town. I had had considerable experience from some good lawyers in Knoxville, uh, good lawyers. And uh, so they knew me and uh, they trusted me and they, the bar came to me, uh, uh, the Goddards, the Gambles, the Goddards, uh, and uh, the Crawfords, and uh, asked me if I, take the job. And I said, well, I, I'd love to take the job, but, but, I, but I, I don't want to have to run against somebody the first time around. I mean, I got to run this fall. I got to, I was appointed, be appointed in, in March, March 14th, 1972. And uh, I'd have to run in August. And I had no political base. I was no politician. I, I, I'd, I, I I just didn't get involved in politics, and I think that's another reason why the bar wanted me. You know, they they do beat me if they wanted to, and I didn't belong to anybody. I I wasn't owned by anybody. I didn't have any that many friends over in Blunt County at that time, so I could be objective. They thought, and so 
They agreed to do that. They give me give me eight years, basically. And I never had any opposition. I ran two times, stayed there 13 years. You indicated earlier that your dad thought that that would not be the right career path for you to no, take. No, he didn't think, you know, so you can't make a living over there doing that. Got all these children. And by that time, I had, uh, I had five children. I had uh, twin girls and and a little one on the way. I, she wasn't here quite then, but I had her after I went on the bench. $17,500 a year. That salary went up uh, pretty doggone quick. I had enough money from my practice that I could close out that I made, you know, I, I, you know, I made $34,000 that year. So I knew I could make it all right, no problem. And I'd been buying and selling some real estate, so. Uh, I survived, and uh, we were living up Blackberry Farm, my family was, my, my wife and children. And uh, so it worked out somehow or another, Howard, I don't know how, but we were, we were, we were a little bit worried. <laughs> you, you, I think you said your dad <laughs> thought you might be a little too rambunctious to be a judge? Too young. You're just too young. You like to get in trouble, he says. You get, you know, you get out here and ramming around at night and stuff. You can't do that as a judge. You're gonna have to go home, stay home close to the fire, and go to church every Sunday and act like somebody. You know, I don't know whether you can do that or not. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> who was the best lawyer who ever tried a case in your court in Blunt County? The best lawyer? I don't, I don't know. Howard, I don't know. Nobody st sticks out, you know, that much. Uh, I guess because most of them are my contemporaries, and I just, uh, you know, I'm trying to think, Howard. I don't know. You got me. What was the most unusual case you had that you presided over as a state court judge? Oh, I had a bunch of divorce cases contested. Most of them were settled because I'd sell them. I'd get them settled, you know, after I heard just a little proof and I'd take the lawyers back and we'd talk about it and then get it together, you know, come up with a way to work it out. But anyway, I had to try this case with Jerry Cunningham and Houston Goddard. Now, if you know those two guys, you know that they're just uh, full of themselves. And uh, we had a, a couple of these litigants and witnesses were talking to God, you know, uh, literally. And the God was telling them to do this, that, and the other. And uh, uh, Houston and Jerry had a blast with that. I mean, and I couldn't get them calmed down. And uh, this case went on for three days, a divorce case. That was very unusual. Oh, I tried, uh, Lou Wolf came over and tried some cases. He did a good job uh, of product liability cases with the Alcoa uh, involving thermostats and such as that. And, uh, uh, and then I had, uh, I tried a criminal case. My first criminal case as a judge, I tried over there, involved a robbery of a drugstore. I, I, I didn't, I didn't try criminal cases, but we got so far behind in our criminal docket, I was helping out, and um, that was a real interesting case. And I really think criminal cases are more interesting than civil cases. They're, they're, they're interesting, you know. That wasn't part of your jurisdiction, but how many criminal cases did you try while you were over in there? Well, I don't know, four or five, not many. But it was concurrent jurisdiction. I had jurisdiction, but I, didn't, I just didn't. Wasn't the original jurisdiction, and that later became a circuit court, just like everybody, all the rest of them, you know, now district court. The uh, as as the United States District Judge, of course, you've had law clerks. Uh, you didn't have any law clerks as a state court judge, did you? No. no, no, no. Uh, Flew by the seat of my pants. <laughs> somehow. Uh, as a state court judge, what sort of technology after the selectronic? did the state provide you? 
I don't know, a, a, dicta a dictating machine and uh, some books. And, and that, that was it? That was it, yeah, oh yeah. The Mary Lou Heath became your secretary after you became judge uh, in Maryville? No, federal co court. Oh, okay. She was oh, Bob Campbell's firm. So she and, joined uh, you She here. was a political appointee. Uh, Bob had called me up and said, now, I, you know, Bob and I and, uh, and Bruce Foster had, had a conversation about this position of federal judgeship. And uh, that came about because I made it my business to, to, to make it come about because I knew that those were the two other choices and certainly Bob Campbell was more, more, more experienced and qualified than I was. And so I called Bob and I said, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to take, you want this position. I don't want to get in it because I know you're more qualified, blah, blah. And then, you, you, you know, I, I'm just not going to stick my nose in. But if you're not going to be interested, I'm interested. And he said, I'll call you back. So they had a prayer meeting over there and he decided he couldn't live on the salary of a district judge. Or his wife did. I forget which one. And uh, then I called, then I talked to Bruce, and Bruce was older and more experienced than I was, and a fine lawyer and a great guy, and he made a heck of a good judge. And uh, uh, Bruce, Bruce did the same thing. He and Betsy talked, and, and they decided, no, they didn't want to, he decided he didn't want to end his life in the judiciary. And that's what it is, a dead end. Uh, but it's, and it's something I always wanted to do. And uh, so he said no. And so I uh, put my hat in the ring and uh, called uh, the one, the only Howard Baker and uh, talked to him. And uh, he said he didn't know that he had some other people he was looking at and uh, he'd let me know. And uh, one of them, I, I didn't not, did not know it at the time, was Jimmy Duncan. And uh, so, uh, somehow or another, Howard Baker decided that uh, um, he was going to nominate me uh, to the, uh, recommend me to the president. Now, the senator always has the, the call on it. And that's how I got to be a district judge. Uh, but This uh, was in 1980. Eighty-four, summer of eighty-four, and Knoxville had been given an extra seat. Judgeship, yeah, yes, yeah. So I was to get that judgeship, and so we started the process, and uh, uh, and it is a process. It's a tedious process. If you go, go on a federal bench, it, there are all kinds of things. You just got to stop your life and and uh, fill out forms and, and submit writings and to, to the Justice Department and then to the ABA and uh, it's like trying to get uh, through, through the eye of a needle, you know. Uh, you got to, it's hard to do and do it right. And so Foster Arnett called me and he said, uh, you need some help with the ABA. I said, I'd take all the help I could get. <laughs> and uh, so he helped me get together all my, 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 my materials. And then I had a fella, a dear man, uh, uh, Buzz Thomas, Judge Thomas's brother, who's now head of a foundation here in town, was uh, head of what? What did he do? What did he do? He was a, he's been around. He was he was a lobbyist for the for the Southern Baptist Convention at one time. Very religious fella, Democrat called me on the phone. He said, Judge, can I help you with this things you've got to get together for this thing? And I said, well, Buzz, I mean, I didn't know him hardly, but I knew Kelly real well. He's a Democrat, too. And, uh, and uh, I said, well, thank you, Buzz. Sure. And so Buzz came over, and we, we pulled the briefs, and he went over them, and he, he picked out some, you know, he thought were good, and not briefs, but opinions. And those opinions, I mean, 
uh, I wrote every one of them. I mean, uh, and very fast, quickly too. I mean, I didn't have a clerk or anything. I just had to go, you know. Most of my opinions came from the bench. But as a chancellor, I had to write opinions. And so, anyway, we got that stuff together. But, you know, uh, help can come from, come right out of the blue, you know, or just lucky, really lucky. Do you recall who your ABA interviewer was? Uh, it was a lawyer from uh, uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And I'd have to dig through the files to find his name, but he was a, a real gentleman. And he came up and I met him out at the Hilton Hotel at the airport and we, he interviewed me out there. And uh, he was very nice. I think he was surprised that I was as young as I was when I was 40, I guess 47, I guess, 47. A young 47, and uh, he, uh, he he said he gave me a qualified rating, and not very well qualified, but qualified. You know, I didn't have the uh, the uh, the credentials at the law school that uh, I should have had, but I didn't. Uh, the uh, Uh, the process uh, continued on, and uh, uh, I didn't think I was going to make it that term. It, it, it got to be October, and, and uh, Congress was going to adjourn, and I'd all but given up, and the uh, uh, president called and uh, had said, uh, oh, when the president called, I was not at the house. I was out hunting. And uh, uh, and uh, so the this was President Reagan. Reagan, President Reagan. And of course, before he comes on, they got somebody that says the president would like to speak to Judge Jarvis. He calls me at home. And uh, the maid answered the phone. And so the maid the maid said, "Expletive! It's the president." Ms. Jarvis, <laughs> Pam got the phone, talked to the man, and said that he wasn't there. So when the president called me at the office, I was prepared at that time. I, uh, I knew he was going to call, and he called from Air Force One, come across the country, and said he was going to appoint me. What did I think about that? And he had some papers there that he was going to sign, and this, that, and that. But anyway, I didn't think I was going to get confirmed, and so. It was the last evening the Congress met in 1984, and Howard Baker was there, and he was trying to make a deal with Frank, with the, with with the Senator Byrd. He'd already gotten Julia Gibbons, and he'd, he'd gotten a couple of two or three other appointments in Tennessee at that time, and he didn't know whether he'd get one more or not, but he was going to try, and he did. And. Uh, I don't know what kind of deal he made with Bert, but anyhow, at the last moment, they got it on the floor and I got affirmed. And Howard couldn't, couldn't find me because I'd gone off down to the beach and I was staying in some condominiums over at Litchfield by the sea. And so Pam knew where I was and they called down there and I talked to Howard from the floor of the Senate, McMahon first and then Howard. And then uh, he said, you're a lucky man. I said, I know I am. He said, you are a federal judge. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no. I couldn't believe it either because it was expedited. I mean, I was in the middle of the summer, applied for the job, and in October I had it, see, pretty quick. <laughs> FBI comes over and they meet with you, scare you to death. Uh, I'll give you a nervous breakdown, you know. You gotta tell them everything you ever did in your life. I broke out some street lights one time on Halloween. I had to tell them that. <laughs> and then I got stopped one time for fishing out of season in the park. Uh, uh, they said I was out of season. I, 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 was, I still think I'm right, but maybe not. Obviously not right because Harv Duggins tried me and found me guilty. Paul Parker represented me. 
They took they fined me seventy five dollars and put me on probation in the park for a year. Now you talk about tough, Howard. You're a Democrat anyway. He he <laughs> took fixed by a clock. I don't believe he'd done that to anybody else, but he did, and so. As a part of the process uh, to become the district judge, did you have to appear in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee? Oh, sure. And uh, how'd that go? Oh, that was uh, that was scary. Uh, uh, we went up there the night before, and I and my children were all in school, and my wife teaching school, and so and we couldn't afford all those plane tickets, and anyway, so. I took my daughter Louise, she went half fair. She was just a little one, little little kid, little cotton headed girl. And uh, we went to Washington and uh, neither one of us knew what we were doing. And so we got on a train at the airport, went in the National Airport, got a train, went to, to it downtown Washington, had a, had a room there. And uh, then I went over to the Howard's office, Howard Baker's office. Never been to Washington before. And uh, uh, talked to this fella, uh, who was Howard's, uh, I don't know, some kind of assistant. And uh, he, he says, now, Jarvis, uh, look here. Here's what Strom Thurmond's going to ask you tomorrow. And he had, he, and I started writing it down, you know. He said, now, don't you bring that in there. <laughs> it had sent it. It had said it here, you understand? I said, I do understand. I said, I said I'm not going to have any notes, period. He said, that's good. So I knew what they were going to ask me, or I was told what they were going to ask me, but still I didn't know. And I, you know, there's some other members on that committee, uh, you know, Kennedy and some others, but Strom was the chairman. And uh, there were several judges there that morning for, 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 for hearings. And uh, they all had a great number of people with them. Uh, their law firm, and they'd come up on private planes and brought people up there, you know, and they just filled this room up. You've seen the room on television, you know, it's got those tables with the green under the glass, you know, and all those people up there sitting. Scary situation. <laughs> And so I had Louise. Louise and was your entourage? She was it. And so uh, I figured, you know, psychologically that'll help me. And it turns out it did. Uh, so after we got, they, I was the last one. They had Barefoot Sanders from, uh, from Texas. Laws, he had a, I bet you had 50 people with him, you know, very popular man. And a few other people from Texas and from Alabama and and Ted Milburn was there. Ted was uh, getting confirmed for the Court of Appeals at that time. That's before Judge Egger went on the bench. So it was Hull and I when we first started out, and Judge Taylor, who was uh, disabled at that time, wasn't trying anything. So two judges take care of the whole district. And that was a tough time, and I was new. Uh, so uh, he asked the questions he was supposed to ask, and I answered them. And then he said, well, who's here with you today, Judge Jarvis? I said, well, I have my little daughter Louise here. Anybody else here, Judge Jarvis? He said, I got word from Howard Baker. He's tied up down in this thing, and I don't know where Congressman Duncan is. Of course, Congressman Duncan was mad, I think. And uh, he wasn't there, so there wasn't anybody. There was Mar uh, Margaret, somebody, a Democratic congressman from Chattanooga, what was her name? Marion? I want to say Albright, but that didn't write. Uh, anyway, she was there for Ted, see? The only one. <laughs> I had nobody, nobody, except Louise. Well, that was after he got through questioning me. And so he said, now, we're going to adjourn. He said, what I want you to do, uh, Judge Jarvis, is bring little Louise up here. <laughs> that I went up there and he came down and he grabbed her and held her and carried her around the courtroom. They made pictures of her at Strom. It was the most wonderful thing that <laughs> Louise will ever forget, and I won't either. Uh, didn't have a bit of trouble getting through there. Uh, 
Uh, we were really happy. We were really happy. It treated us real well. You came home and you were a United States District Judge. Mm -hmm. And what sort of docket faced you shortly after you well, took the, the docket, bench here? Well, the docket really grew. It started growing and it got big. It got bigger than it's ever been. And uh, uh, we Why were, do you think that was? Well, the thing was, uh, Judge Taylor had been ill and, and he, he, he hadn't been able to really handle the docket. And he was, he was out of something to do, actually, and he was very tough on the lawyers. He, he'd have Carl Softball, or Carl Softball would call you, and he'd say, Judge Taylor wants to see you. Carl was the clerk of the court at that yeah, time. Yeah, he was the clerk of the court. And uh, he got a lot of blame, and Judge Taylor got a lot of blame uh, for Carl's, uh, uh, I soon found that out. He tried to do the same thing to me call lawyers and act like a big shot and, and tell them the judge wanted them. I didn't want them. I didn't, I don't, I never call a lawyer short notice and tell them, come down here. That's not my nature, never has been, never will be. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be considerate of people. They got other things to do in that one lawsuit. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, forgotten where I was, but anyhow, that, 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 uh, your docket was growing. Oh, it was awful. And uh, so I decided I was going to set my own cases. I didn't call a docket. I set them on notice. Judge Taylor always sounded his docket, and he'd bring all the bar down, you know, how he used to do. Fill the whole room up and spend a half a day or a whole day. Uh, I was down there one day sounding the docket, Judge Taylor, and uh, so he was going to sentence somebody there at the time. And you remember Jim, the uh, the uh, uh, black American bailiff, who bailiff, was just a yes. wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he was the bailiff and always had been since I'd been practicing there. But Jim was there, and uh, this defendant was a, a, a African American as well. And uh, he had his wife and children there and everybody. And uh, Judge sentenced him and they started hollering and crying, you know, carried on. Judge says, take that mother out of here. And Jim escorted the defendant out. <laughs> and Judge looked around and said, well, I mean, that, that mother. He said, I want that mother out of here. <laughs> oh, he said. The marshal will take care of him to escort the mother out. <laughs> hey, a lot of mercy. That was, that was funny. Everybody in the courtroom laughed. That's a story that went everywhere real quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it sounded like docket, and you just, you just uh, stay there all day long. Why don't we take our break at this, at this time? That'd be fine. And, and then we'll have... Um, just a little bit more to do.